Good evening, everyone. So good to see you all here. Blessed Great Lake Church of Christ. Wednesday evening worship service. Bible study. So just about everybody I've seen today. I greeted them. And I said, do you know the story of Jesus? So people People said, I don't know. But every one of those people that had an answer, I said, tell me the story of Jesus. Do you know the story? I said, yes, but I love to hear the story. Tell me the story. What an icebreaker. And the thought of this came after our evangelism class on Monday night. I left, uh, left here on Monday night very inspired, and I hope that my inspiration will spread to you, because right now, with Easter on its way, Jesus is in the air, and we need to take advantage of it. I believe that's what he would want us to do. Let's sing. Come, let us all unite to sing God is love. Let
most precious one. I'm so happy to be here. We know that you're here with us. Let's go out to it all together. We know that you're with us. Just your love for us is undying, and our love for you is also undying. You do so much for us, and we just so hope for you that we need to we need to improve on that. We just need to do more for you because you do everything for us. We ask that you take care of us, take care of those homeless people out there who need shelter and they need nourishment. But just give them some help to do that. We ask these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand a wonderful savior is jesus my lord he takes my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine i sing in my rapture oh glory to god for such a redeemer he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my soul in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness transformed, His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand. We'll have one more song before our lesson. It's number 490. It's, it is well with my soul. Let's sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul. 
sinned, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh. shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well Time for our classes. All right, good evening. Let's try again. Good evening. Okay, we can hear me now. Very good. All right, we are going to continue our study of Philippians. Last week, we kind of introduced uh, the, the book. We looked a little bit about the culture of Philippi, and we noted that it was then uh, a very, very Roman city. Everything about it was modeled after Rome, and in fact, the people that settled there uh, were mostly Roman military veterans. Uh, so there would have been a great deal of uh, Roman pride, if you will, a great deal of patriotism, and the idea of civic duty would have been something very, um, very much on the mind uh, of the people and something that was understood. Right? And so now after Paul um, and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, have introduced themselves, they've noted the brethren, now we're going to get into the, um, the meat, uh, if you will, of the letter beginning in verse 3. So read with me. Beginning in verse 3, it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, just as it is right for me to thank this of you, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both in my chains and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of me of grace." For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. All right, so we'll start... Go back and break this down, starting here in verse 3, where he says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making a request for you all with joy. Notice all the times that he uses these, these words, all or every. Right? How, how does it seem that Paul feels about the Philippian brethren? What's his attitude towards them? Yeah, we see this attitude of love because it seems like they are constantly on his mind. He's constantly thinking about them, and he doesn't seem like he can express enough uh, of his thankfulness to them. Uh, when he talks about in this, <clears throat> where it says, Every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. 
this idea of prayer and making requests both have the same root word, uh, which is the idea of earnestly or humbly requesting something. Uh, the work that they shared together meant that Paul knew the things that they struggled with, and he prayed for them on a regular basis. Why, and while Paul is offering those prayers, what was his attitude in prayer? What does it say at the end of, their, end of verse 4? Yeah, he, he was joyful, right? He was making those requests with all joy, right? Um, praying for these brethren was not a burden to Paul, but it brought joy to him. Thinking about these brethren wasn't a burden, but it brought joy to him. It was a blessing. Paul wanted to pray for them. Um, it was certainly a joy for Paul, and I can imagine that hearing about Paul's uh, affection and constant prayers for them would have been very encouraging uh, for the Philippians, especially considering everything that Paul had done um, in establishing the congregation in Philippi, but also all the other things that he had done in the kingdom that certainly uh, they knew about. And this idea of praying for the brethren, praying for each other, uh, is something that should be um, common for us. Right? Paul was saying in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, and 17, rejoice always, Pray without ceasing, right? So as we experience joy, we should also be going to God in prayer. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5.25, he says, Brethren, pray for us. Because Paul understood one of the most encouraging things that we can do for each other is to pray for one another. Right? There, you know, there's a reason why people will come forward and to confess that they're struggling with sin in their life or Things are just really difficult and they need prayers because prayer works. Prayer is powerful. And knowing that you have people praying for you can help you get through all kinds of challenges. right? And so we need to be candid about what our prayer needs are. You know, Paul was not afraid to ask for prayers. Because he said, hey, this work is difficult. I want you to pray that our work is fruitful and that God opens a door for the gospel to be preached. Right? Well, all of us struggle, and we all need one another, so be candid about what you need when we pray. Right? And so we have to think about how often we pray for each other. And not only how often we pray for each other, but how often do we ask for prayers? I'm the type of person that sometimes the hardest thing for me to do is to ask for help. Right? Where somebody asks me to do something, I'm like, okay, I, I have to shoulder this burden all on my own, and I have to be the one that does it. And that's not really the case. Right? We can ask for help, and that includes asking your brethren for prayers. Right? And so Paul here was making it very clear that he was joyful in offering his care and concerns to God on their behalf. And then when we look here in verse 5, what was it that motivated Paul's prayer? He was making requests with all joy, why? Yeah, because of their fellowship or their participation in the gospel. Right? Now, this word fellowship indicates more than just their bond shared in Jesus Christ. The base word, the base meaning of the word is association, partnership, or as Ron's uh, translation put it, joint participation. Right? It, it's the, the root word is this idea of being something that is common. Right? So they jointly participated together in the gospel. Well, in other places, this word can also refer to a monetary gift. For example, in Romans chapter 15, verses 25 and 26, Paul says, I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. The word in Romans 15 translated contribution is the same word here that is translated as fellowship. This idea of joint participation. In this instance in Romans 15, he was taking a monetary contribution from the saints to go and offer relief to those in Jerusalem who were victims of an earthquake. Right? They were working together in the gospel. Well, later on in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 16, 
or 14 and 16, we learn that the Philippian congregation had a long history of providing financial assistance to Paul. In Philippians 4, beginning of verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, you've done well in that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Right, so the congregation there in Philippi, at least according to Philippians 4, they were involved in providing financial assistance to Paul as he went across these missionary journeys. In any way, they were a, a sponsoring congregation for Paul as a missionary. And so from the very beginning of Paul's ministry, the people in Philippi worked to give Paul all of the things he needed, or at least to the extent they were able to, to provide for um, his ministry. And we see here that Paul maintained contact with the Philippian church and visited them uh, throughout his ministry when he would go on his different journeys. One thing that we need to take away from this when he talks about this fellowship in the gospel is that even Paul the apostle needed assistance from others to do the work of God. Remember, Paul was an apostle. He was a fervent worker he was a faithful man. He had the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. But he also needed the joint participation of the church. He wasn't going to be able to do all of these things on his own. Right? He needed the help of others. And that includes people like us. It doesn't, doesn't matter what you are or what gifts you think you have. You have something that you can offer to the church, and Paul was commending these brethren for the way that they had participated with him. All right, moving on into verse six, he says, "Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ." All right, that he who has begun a good work in you, who was the one who began that work in the Philippians? Was it Paul or was it God? It was God. Right? Paul brought the message to them, but the one who began the work on the Philippians was God himself. Right? Paul simply brought the message to them. Uh, you know, Without God saving work, these people would not have believed. They wouldn't be working together with Paul on any level if it weren't for the saving work and the plan of salvation set up by God. The work that God began was also going to be completed or made perfect by God. What Paul is trying to point out to them is that, hey, God finishes what he starts. Meaning that the, the Philippians, their salvation, it was secure. And Paul was confident in this. I'm confident that what God began, he is going to finish because he has already seen evidence of their faithfulness through their participation with him. Right? Now, when he talks about God was going to complete this work, it wasn't if all of a sudden that God was going to take over and that the Philippians no longer had any responsibility. That's not what, what, God, what Paul was trying to get at at all. Right? But God does work through us in advancing his will here on earth. Right? Jesus Christ is the head, and so what are we? We are the body of Christ. Right? That's how God manipulates and acts in the world today is through us and through our sharing of the gospel and sharing of Jesus Christ. Right? And so God was going to complete this work, um, and they were all going to do it together. Right? And again, we've mentioned this idea of togetherness that we've seen in Philippians. Paul worked together with Timothy. The Father works together with the Son. The Philippians worked together with Paul. God was working together with the Philippians. This idea of unity and togetherness is going to be going all throughout the book. All right, so this idea of God completing a work in us. If you reference Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it says, We are his what? Handiwork. We are his handiwork. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? God created us in Christ Jesus so that we could be workers in the kingdom. Right? It's not that working gets the salvation, 
We were saved so that we could do good work for God. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says, Be my brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Right? Through God, they were going to be able to continue doing that good work that God had begun in them at salvation. Now they were going to continue doing it. And Paul was confident that through the Lord they would continue doing this good work. right. Jesus completed his work of salvation on the cross. That's why we have any hope at all. And so we need to be busy completing our work until he returns. Right. Contributions and, and sharing the gospel to the Herod Emperor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, our, everything that we do in the kingdom has value, eternal value. Beyond anything that we're going to do in a career, the contributions that we make, either through our, our money or our time or our, our blood, sweat, and tears into the kingdom has an eternal payoff, right? There, we're going to get an eternal return on investment, right? It's going to go far beyond anything we can earn in this life. Read that in verse 4. Who, who you will repay God? He who has begun a good work in you will complete it. God is the one who seems to be doing the good work. Exactly. Right. And again, Talking about salvation, God saved us so that we could work, but God did all the work for salvation. I, 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 didn't, I didn't do any of it. All I did was believe. All I did was accept the, the gift that God had offered me. Yes. Yeah, God, as Joe points out, God is going to be working on us our whole lives. Right? He's going to continue to be shaping us and molding us, right? That that work isn't complete until we're done, right? That that work is always going to be this ongoing process, right? And so he tells them here in verse seven, then, after about his confidence that this work would be completed, he says, "I have you in my heart." Um, you have to remember where was Paul when he was writing this letter? In jail, in jail or at least he was at least under Roman house arrest. Right? He, he was not a free man at the time that he was writing this letter. Um, Paul had a very strong fellowship with them because they provided for him even when he was in prison and unable to provide for himself. He still had this connection with the Philippians. So even if they were separated by hundreds of miles, they were still there in Paul's heart. And then he brings up and references his chains he says, as both in my chains and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Right? So we already mentioned that Paul was there. He was chained. He wasn't able to do what he wanted. But together they were partakers of grace. How were the Philippians partaking with Paul? In the spirit. Right? In the spirit? How? Because right? we, we know they all share within that same spirit. They're all working towards the same goal through what the spirit has provided. They were all sealed by the same spirit through that inheritance. But how are they participating with Paul in that grace? Yeah, through their gift, through their giving. It wasn't just, you know, they sent Paul on their way and that was that. They were doing what they could as much as they could uh, so that he could continue doing this work. And so Paul was confident through their contributions, through their continued uh, care for him, that God would complete his work, and reminding them that what they were doing had value. Right? That what they were doing, they got to partake in all of this good work that Paul was doing. They got to share some of the fruit of that good work because of their contribution. All right? So they were working together, and Paul was encouraging them to continue doing this. Right? And then he says here, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all, the affection of Jesus Christ. This idea of longing for is talking about an intense desire, right? This really longing for something that we've lost, something that is no longer in our possession. And he says, I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. Affection talks about our, right, our deep emotions, inward parts, our feelings, right? That's a pretty bold claim for Paul to say 
I long for you with the affection of Jesus. And again, Paul could say this and feel this way about the Philippians because of how closely they worked with him since the beginning of his ministry. I, you can imagine, you know, every, I'm sure every preacher, for better or worse, remembers the first congregation that he preached at, but especially if it was a good congregation, right? You're going to keep those connections and those relationships with you for a long time, right? And so Paul says, I long for you with the affection of Christ. And that affection of Christ is exactly what God demands we show to each other. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, he says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Right? We should want to be in the presence of other Christians. We should want to engage in relationships with each other. And then, of course, John 13, 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Right? Jesus loved us immensely. Right? He, he loved us enough to leave the comfort of heaven and come to earth and to be killed on the cross for our sins. And the love that motivated Jesus to do all of that is the same love that he expects for us to have for one another. And so when Paul says, I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ, he's not boasting. This is exactly what God expects of all of his children. He's just reminding them of this great relationship that they share because of their joint participation together in doing the work of God. That's the foundation of that relationship, right? So uh, reminding them of all of these things, of his confidence, of their partaking together, of how much he wants to be there with them. And then he comes into verse 9. It says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense of the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He says, I pray that your love may abound more and more. So what, what is the limit to more and more? Yeah, there is no limit, right? And, and when we're considering with God, especially, there's no limit. And when you think about more and more, there's no quantifiable way to judge how much love I need to acquire, right? He doesn't put a limit on you need to acquire X amount of love to be considered a faithful Christian. He says, no, your love needs to abound, needs to abound more, and then it needs to abound more. It's a continual process where we're never going to have enough. Not in the sense that, you know, we're not going to be good enough, because God wants our best effort always, but in the absence of absolute perfection, which none of us can achieve, there's always going to be room for us to grow. We can always grow in this ability to show love for one another. In this instance, they've shown love to Paul through their monetary gift, and I'm sure there were a lot of Philippian brethren who were praying for Paul just as much as he was praying for them. And that is another way that we show love. And we know that love is a necessary component of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Right? We already looked in uh, John 13, 34. He tells us to love one another as he loved us. And then he says in 1 John 4, 7, and 8, he says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love God, or who does not love, does not know God, for God is love. Okay, and if God is love, then as his children, we need to be love as well. Right? We, we should share in that characteristic of God. And of course, the type of love that is in view here is agape love, right? A self-sacrificing love that puts the good of the object of that love above itself. The other important thing about agape love, or love that Jesus wants us to show to one another, is this is love that doesn't expect reciprocation. Right? I can love someone even if they hate me in return. 
Right? Isn't that exactly what Jesus preached in Matthew 5? Heard, you know, everyone is saying, you hate your enemies. I tell you, no, you love your enemies. Right? That, that's what separates agape love from everything else. It's not dependent on circumstances. It's given no matter what. So he says, I want you to abound in love still more and more. But then he adds a qualifier. He says, I want you to abound in this love in knowledge and all discernment. Our love, if it is going to have the intended effect in doing God's work, must be tempered with knowledge and discernment. Right? What is discernment? Okay, discernment is understanding. Okay, and in this instance, it's being able to look at a work, at a, at a person, at a statement that someone makes, and to be able to say, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this good? Is it bad? Is this better or is this best? That's the idea of discernment. Our love and how we express it to God and our brethren is recorded. The more that we know, right, knowledge and discernment, the more that we know about God, the better we can fulfill the commandment to love one another. Because we'll be, we'll be able to more accurately show that love to each other and to know the types of things we can do to love one another. Right. When we pray for each other, love will abound. It's really hard. You know, you can take any person that maybe you've been having a, uh, a difficult time getting along with. If you take the time to pray for that person and you do it consistently, it becomes a lot harder to look at that person and be angry all the time. Right? When you are taking their cares and concerns to God on their behalf, and you are praying for them with joy, like Paul prayed for the Philippians, it's going to be a lot easier to maintain a good relationship with that person when you are praying for them. All right, very, very good to point out. Now, when we look at this idea of knowledge and discernment, have to remember that we are still in the context of working together. Okay? And the most important aspect of any Bible study is that we have to keep everything in the context it was originally written. Okay? Now, in this specific instance, when Paul is writing to the Philippians, what specifically had they done to show their love for Paul and their love for God? Now, we've mentioned it several times already. They had, given him money. they had given him money. They had given him financial assistance, right? Let's take a step back and try to make an application for us today, okay? Elderships have many opportunities to support many different good works in the kingdom. And there's too many good works to support them all, right? There, there are a lot of them. And so, but the question still remains, okay, as a congregation and as an eldership deciding, okay, where are we going to put our money? What are we going to support? The question becomes... Which works are worthy of our financial support? Which ones do we want to get behind? Okay? The way that we make that decision has to be tempered with knowledge and discernment. Right? We can have great love and affection for somebody involved in a work, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is the best use of the funds that we have. Okay? That's where knowledge and discernment come in. And so... Showing love in the best and most effective way requires a discerning mind. And so that means we have to do our research before we commit to supporting a work. All right, and that's true of an eldership, but we can also apply this to ourselves personally. Right? But before we throw our support behind something, whether with our money or whether we're volunteering our, our, our time towards something, we have to first prove that that work is good and valuable before we can actually uh, put ourselves behind it. Because, right? again, the idea is that we want our love to abound, our love for God to abound, has to be tempered with knowledge. In, so he says here, okay, knowledge and discernment, but why? Here he explains himself in verse 10. 
that you may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Okay? He wants us to approve those things that are the best, that are excellent. Not just those things that are passable, those things that are excellent. But we cannot approve a good work before we first prove that it is good. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, Paul says, Test all things, hold fast that what is good. Okay? And so we have to be able to look at an activity that we can involve ourselves in. Elders need to look at a work that they might want to support and be able to say, okay, what exactly is going on and how is our support going to, to help? And is this the best use of our funds? Have to be able to, to, to prove, okay, this is something that has spiritual value. Right? In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, we have the same idea of examination where Paul says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. So here we have to approve of things only if they are excellent quality. And so this idea goes beyond just deciding between this is right or wrong, or this is doctrinally correct and this is, this is not correct and not something we can do. This goes to deciding between things that are good and something that's better, or is deciding between something that was better and then, oh, here's what is best, depending on our situation, right? And in this instance, really, we're, we're kind of talking about the idea of expedience here, which is making the best use of the resources that we have, right? Um, and doing this is necessary for pleasing God. He says that I want you to do this so that you may be sincere and without offense. The idea of sincerity means unmixed or pure, right? Going with pure motives, that there, there's nothing wrong or untoward about the things that we are doing, okay? When we exercise discernment, we ensure that we're not putting ourselves in a position to displease God or to cause others to stumble because we put ourselves behind the wrong type of work, okay? Let's ask this, though. How might a lack of discernment cause others to stumble? Because right, that's this idea of without offense, right? Without causing a stumbling block, okay? How might a lack of discernment lead others to stumble? Choo choosing the wrong path? Exactly. And in, in this instance, it's talking about a, a work that a congregation may choose to be involved in. I, I'm sure we've seen a lot of congregations that have added in different programs, different, different activities that they want that work to be involved in, but sometimes those activities really toe the line between what is, is good and helpful and what God actually authorizes us to do. Right? I think a lot of congregations have been very well-meaning in introducing mechanical instruments of worship, but that wasn't really a step that they, it's not really where they should have gone. Right? Well-meaning, they wanted to abound in love, but it was lacking knowledge and discernment in that decision. Right? Um, we have to avoid those types of errors so that the church can remain pure and so that we don't become a stumbling block to the brethren who see us, all right? Um, imagine a situation where you've been sending kids to the same church camp forever. But you realize, okay, the, the person who's running this camp, there's some false doctrines that are starting to creep in. Some things that are unbiblical that are starting to be taught at that Bible camp, okay? In that situation, if you are aware of those things as an eldership, what do you do? Okay, so step one, as an eldership, you go and talk to the person who is in charge, right? Make sure that you get all of your ducks in a row and you're getting the story correct, right? That's certainly part of knowledge and discernment, right? We're going to go suss out the problem, right? So say you go and talk to that person and you realize that, you know, you've tried to reason with them, but they hold a position that is not biblical. Say it's something about uh, maybe the necessity of baptism for salvation, 
If they've gone soft and say, well, well, maybe it's not really required. Maybe if they got baptized, you know, for any reason, we can, we can retcon that into saying they were baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and, and they cannot be swayed, okay? So then in that instance, what might be the next step? The what? Yeah. Yeah. Take several more people with you. See if he cannot be reasoned with. And then if that doesn't work, you can go and find another camp. Right? But there's always going to be the temptation. Well, maybe we continue to go because of the relationships that we've been made there. Maybe you're just a member that's been going and you don't want to jeopardize your relationships in this camp. So you don't say anything to the eldership, right? Maybe it's acting out of love. I want to preserve these relationships that I have, but it's lacking knowledge and discernment. Right? We can see how love without knowledge and love without discernment can actually cause, cause problems. Yes, Dana. Yes, um, sometimes it's a matter of maturity and discernment. Even some of the Yeah, Dana brings up a good point. Sometimes we can fall into this trap even on things that are not, they're, they're not bad, right? Talking about things that aren't, they are amoral, right? They're not good, they're not bad, they're, they're just, it's an amoral decision. Something like uh, the schedule of our worship services or the way, the place that we sit in the building, right? All of these things that really have no bearing on what God asks us to do but we can fall into, well, this is the way that we've always done it. And this is the way that we've always done our worship services. And so there's no, there's no reason to change. Right? When we fail to approach those things with a discerning eye and maybe challenge things just because they're the way that we've always done, we may not be doing the best thing for the church. Is that kind of what you're, you're getting at? All right, sometimes we, we fall into doing what we've always done and we limit opportunities to make improvements that would actually enhance our worship, enhance our ability to work, simply because we didn't want to, to change. Part of knowledge and discernment is not only knowing when to put a stop to things that are going the wrong direction, but knowing when, okay, we're going down a good path, but maybe we can find a better one. That's, the, that's, that's another side of the same coin. And so he says here, I want you to do this being filled with the fruit of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. In this case, whenever we see these I in G words, these being filled, right? A lot of times, those modify another noun or verb. In this case, the word being modifies the phrase before it. That is, being filled with the fruits of righteousness is how we abound in love and approve the things that are excellent. Right? Now, when we talk about fruit, what, what is fruit? Yeah, in terms of the gospel, it's souls that are, get sa that, that are saved, absolutely. The gospel is what is planted. The fruit is what is produced, which is a soul that belongs to Jesus Christ. Right? In, in the most generic sense of that word, that fruit is that which is produced. Okay? A, a tree is planted. The fruit is the result of that tree being planted. You can also translate this, this word as simply uh, as crop, right? being filled with the crops of righteousness, right? The end results of righteousness. Now, that righteousness comes by Jesus Christ. We are made right with Christ because he made a sacrifice on our behalf. And when we submit to baptism, our, our sins are cleansed, and he has made us righteous. And so when it talks about the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, the fruit of righteousness is the result of obedience to him. 
So that if we want to approve the things that are excellent and to be sincere, where do we start? Where do we have to start to approve things that are excellent? Ah, the scriptures. Right? Jesus, uh, God, through the Holy Spirit, has revealed to us all the things that we need to know for life and godliness. It's all been recorded right here. We've looked extensively in 1 Peter about this idea of um, inspiration, how these holy men of God were carried along and moved by the Holy Spirit to write these truths. Okay? We have what God wants us to know. We obey God's voice through what he has revealed. Okay? We know God because he's told us the things that he has said. He's told us his will. And so if we want to approve those things that are excellent, we have to start with Scripture. Right? Anytime we're thinking of, oh, hey, this, this seems like a good thing that we could be involved in as a church, we always have to go back to, okay, does it help us fulfill our mission to God and are we doing it in a way that Jesus approves of. That has to be the foundation of every decision. Right? And so when we talk about this idea of discernment, Paul is applying it, I think, here to the Philippians' continued support of work in, in the church and the continued support of other missionaries who would help to grow the church. Right? That seems to be the immediate context. But we can definitely apply this in principle to every decision that we make. Every decision that we make should hopefully be motivated by a love for God, but should also be tempered with knowledge and discernment, that we are making decisions based on what God has revealed, not just on what I feel in the moment. Both things have to go together. And then he says, to the glory and praise of God. And I have quoted, I'm going to quote for us John 15, 5 through 8. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. God is pleased when we work together towards doing the right thing and doing the things that he approves of. Right? So Paul has opened this letter by reminding the Philippians of the great blessings of working together. Right? Working together with other Christians should produce in us faith. It should bring joy. It should encourage us to grow spiritually. And if we use proper knowledge and decision-making, our work will stand out to the glory and praise of God. And that's something that all of us should desire. Yes, Jerry. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Love has to be the starting point, like Joe points out. Who do you love? If we don't love God and we can't get past this idea of wanting love to abound and we aren't motivated by a sincere love for God, none of the other stuff matters, right? Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13. I can do all of these things that, are, that seem good and big and wonderful, but if I have not love, it's useless. It becomes a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. It's just noise if it's not motivated by love. Thank you, Joe, for pointing that out. Any questions or comments before we close for tonight? All right. Appreciate y'all's attention. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, our Lord and our God, we thank you so much for this day and for the opportunity we have to be together, to, to share this time of fellowship and study. And Father, I pray that it has been a, a meaningful uh, meeting for us. Uh, Lord, pray that we might be able to take the things that we've learned to heart, that uh, we truly would take, take solace and comfort in the relationships that we share with each other and that we might motivate one another towards greater service for you and that uh, everything we do would be motivated by a love for you, a desire to do right, and Lord, that we may learn more about you each and every day, that we might grow to be more like you so that we can make the best decisions for ourselves, for our families, 
and for the lost souls that we are trying to reach. Lord, be with us as we leave here. Watch over us. Keep us safe until we can return, if it be your will. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all are dismissed.